So, I'm about to compare Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Guardians of the Galaxy series, more particularly Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. However, I don't intend for this to be a simple compare and contrast. This will be an exploration of the universal themes contained in Frankenstein and how Guardians of the Galaxy comments on and in some cases extends those themes. Moreover, as I explained in my Bluey video, I'm not suggesting that James Gunn intended direct references to Frankenstein when writing his stories, but here's the thing. All stories are inherently in dialogue with each other by virtue of being a story. We can call back to the monomyth and the hero with a thousand faces, but more broadly, remember what John Green said, all reading is an act of empathy. As I've said before several times, all literature is about what it means to be human. We can take the human experience in any story and relate it to any other story. Making connections is the highest form of literary analysis. When you read something and think, oh, this reminds me of this other thing I read, then you're getting it. Here's an easy way to think about it. Every person on this earth can connect with any other person should they choose to. We're all just people living on this earth, and we all have at least that in common. In the same way, every story has a life of its own. And like people, stories can connect without even meaning to. So with that understanding, let's get into it. First, a very brief summary of Frankenstein. There's this guy named Victor Frankenstein. He's real smart. He sets out to create a new species. He's obsessed with this ambition, so much so that he abandons his studies and stops communicating with his family. By stitching together detached parts from human beings, he ultimately creates life. However, upon seeing the ugliness of his creature, he abandons it. Sometime later, Victor returns to be with his family, but everyone around him starts dying. The creature is the culprit. He confronts Victor and explains how he survived in the wilderness with his superhuman strength and endurance. He watched a family from afar and learned how to speak from them. He was rejected by all who saw him, making him bitter toward humanity. He demands that Victor create a female companion for him, at which point the monster will leave him alone. Victor initially complies, traveling to the UK to create a woman in secret, but he dismantles her before finishing, leading the creature to kill Henry Clerval, Victor's best friend, as well as Elizabeth, Victor's fiance. So Victor chases the monster far north. A ship finds Victor amid the ice, taking him in as he's nearly freezing to death. Victor tells his story to the ship's captain, Robert Walton. As Victor is nearly dead, the monster comes and claims him, taking him away so the two may die together. The connection between Frankenstein and Guardians of the Galaxy would seem simple enough. Rocket has always had a pretty clear Frankenstein complex. As he says in the first movie, Why well, didn't ask to get made? I didn't ask to be torn apart and put back together over and over and turned into some... some little monster! But there's even more to it than that, especially in Volume 3. There are three big ideas that I want to touch on, each one shared in both works. The three big ideas are 1. Possession, 2. Ignorance is bliss, and 3. Obsession. And just so we're all clear, I'm using the Dover Thrift edition of Frankenstein, first published in 1994, with my copy produced in 2015. The page numbers will correspond with this version of the text. Project Gutenberg has the entire text of Frankenstein available online, so if you need to find any of the quotes I'm using, use Ctrl F on the online text. We see the idea of possession in Guardians of the Galaxy through Peter and Gamora, and the remnants of their romantic relationship. Peter and Gamora were once in love, but that Gamora was killed by Thanos and a Gamora from a different timeline took her place, abandoning Peter and the Guardians. Mary Shelley was in a good place to comment on family dynamics and romantic relationships. As she wrote in the author's introduction, My husband was from the first very anxious that I should prove myself worthy of my parentage and enroll myself on the page of fame. Mary Shelley had a somewhat unique perspective on relationships. Her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, was not the best guy, according to reports. A good writer, but not the most faithful partner, even before he was with Mary. That likely informed a lot of the relationship dynamics in Frankenstein. Ultimately, Peter's push for Mary to write Frankenstein was a good thing, and a little pushing from Peter toward Gamora wasn't totally wrong either. Moreover, the idea of parentage is really important here. 
Mary Shelley's mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was a prolific writer and philosopher famous for having written A Vindication of the Rights of Women, along with other works. Mary's father, William Godwin, was also decently famous as a journalist and political philosopher. Percy was a huge fan of Mary's parents and a follower of William's political beliefs. For Percy, Mary's parentage was very important. For all of Percy's faults, he did truly love Mary, at least for a time. But one has to wonder how much Mary's bloodline factored into Percy's fancy. Similarly, parentage plays into the romance in Frankenstein. Victor's love interest, Elizabeth, is technically Victor's adopted sister. The two refer to each other as cousins, though they say it's with fondness and affection. Elizabeth loves Victor, that's apparent, but a reader has to wonder if she really had any other choice. Just look at the way she's presented to Victor. Victor's mother says, I have a pretty present for my Victor, tomorrow he shall have it. And when on the morrow she presented Elizabeth to me as her promised gift, I with childishness interpreted her words literally, and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love, and cherish. All praises bestowed on her I received as made to a possession of my own. It's like Elizabeth was conditioned to feel affection for Victor from the moment she was introduced to him, similar to how Percy was somewhat predisposed to feel attraction to Mary. There's a question to be had with Gamora and Peter. Peter was essentially the first man Gamora met once she escaped Thanos' clutches. Did she fall for him because of that? The Gamora in Guardians of the Galaxy 3 had other options, and we see that she doesn't fall for Peter again. Their parentage is worth taking into account. Peter had a terrible absentee father and a good mother who was gone too soon. Gamora had an abusive adoptive father who stuck around far too long. They both had parental issues, which was another thing that drew them together. And when Gamora in Volume 3 finds Peter's backpack and understands his past a little better, that's when she lightens up to him. By that same token, when Peter realizes this Gamora has lived a different life than the previous Gamora, he dials back his aggressive notion that she become what he knew her as. The Gamora that we once knew probably felt a lot of freedom with Peter. There's a character in Frankenstein named Safi. She becomes part of the family that the creature observes, and it's through Safi's education the creature learns language. Safi's father was an imprisoned Turkish man who tried to use Safi to gain freedom. Her father knew she was interested in a young man, so he thought to use the young man to try and gain freedom. Quote, the Turk allowed this intimacy to take place, and encouraged the hopes of the youthful lovers, while in his heart he had formed far other plans. Much like a certain Gamora we know whose father used her to reach his own ends. Eventually, Safi escapes her father and joins Felix, her lover, and his family. Shelley writes, The prospect of marrying a Christian and remaining in a country where women were allowed to take a rank in society was enchanting to her. For women in Safi's time and region, the chance to marry Felix probably did feel like freedom, but she only had so many options. Did the Gamora from the original timeline really have that many options? How free was she? She escaped Thanos, met the Guardians, and just stuck with them. The Gamora from the other timeline got the chance to explore, chose a different path, and that was okay. Of course, Peter has a hard time accepting that given his history with the other Gamora, and that leads him to be a little possessive. Now, Victor is very possessive of Elizabeth, we know this. When expressing his desire to marry her, he phrases it as, I might claim Elizabeth. But interestingly, the monster also expresses a desire to have a woman in a possessive sense. He wants Victor to create for him a companion that he can essentially raise and court. He realized when looking at Safi and Felix, no Eve soothed my sorrows nor shared my thoughts. It's understandable for the monster to want company and friendship. That's what anyone wants. But why does he want a woman specifically? He uses the term Eve after finding Paradise Lost, an epic poem about Satan's expulsion from heaven and the Garden of Eden. The poem seems to suggest Adam cannot be without a woman, but that's a pretty dangerous mindset. This is an issue the Barbie movie delved into so excellently. If Ken isn't happy with himself, how is he going to be happy once he has Barbie? Patriarchy's harm goes both ways, making women feel worthless by turning them into objects, but making men feel worthless if they don't own said objects. This is why Mantis encourages Peter to find self-fulfillment instead of hoping that Gamora might come back to him. As Victor explains in the book, 
A traveler's life is one that includes much pain amidst its enjoyments. His feelings are forever on the stretch, and when he begins to sink into repose, he finds himself obliged to quit that on which he rests in pleasure for something new, which again engages his attention, and which also he forsakes for other novelties. Now this is just Victor's assertion of his friend, Henry Clerval, but he does have a modicum of a point. Just like Mantis said, if Peter keeps jumping from lily pad to lily pad, he'll never learn how to swim. That doesn't mean a traveler necessarily has to give up their travels, but they have to do what they've got to do to find their personal fulfillment. For Henry Clerval, the fulfillment comes in traveling itself. For Peter, he decides it could come through reconnecting with his roots. In his case, that does mean putting his travels on hold. And Mantis is right in trying to encourage Peter to move on from his sadness in one way or another. Victor's dad tries to encourage Victor similarly. It is also a duty owed to yourself, for excessive sorrow prevents improvement or enjoyment, or even the discharge of daily usefulness without which no man is fit for society. This is almost decent advice. Victor's father has a point. Wallowing in sadness without looking to improve or get help is detrimental, but the reasoning is off. Alphonse says that one should overcome their sorrow so they can be useful in society, and not for the individual well-being of the person who sorrows. Ultimately, Peter chooses to leave the Guardians and make a connection with his grandpa. He won't be doing good by the galaxy anymore as Star-Lord, but he will be doing good by himself as he seeks familial fulfillment. It's easy to read that decision as selfish, but it reminds me of this quote from Bojack Horseman. Sometimes you need to take responsibility for your own happiness. You don't think that's a little selfish? I don't know what to tell you. I'm happy for the first time in my life, and I'm not going to feel bad about it. It takes a long time to realize how truly miserable you are, and even longer to see that it doesn't have to be that way. Only after you give up everything can you begin to find a way to be happy. So... Victor, the creature, and Peter. Each of them was a bit blinded by the desire for companionship. They forgot about humanity and agency. So what does the opposite look like? Well, we see that from Elizabeth in Frankenstein. There's an instance in the book where she takes Victor's misery to mean that he doesn't want to marry her anymore. She tells him, It is your happiness I desire as well as my own when I declare to you that our marriage would render me eternally miserable unless it were the dictate of your own free choice. Look how mature Elizabeth is. A reader has to wonder, if Elizabeth didn't love Victor, would he respect her enough to let her live her own life? Or would he just have her marry him anyway? Because that's kind of the situation Peter is in at the start of Volume 3. Like, think about it. Elizabeth loves Victor like crazy, but she sees his humanity so prominently that she can't bear the idea of taking his free will. Just as she says, if he doesn't choose marriage for himself, she doesn't want him to do it. Victor's agency is tantamount to Elizabeth. On the other hand, when Peter confronts the new Gamora, he doesn't consider her agency at first. He's only focused on his wants and his perception of her. Eventually, Peter comes around and realizes the error of his ways. As I said before, Gamora also recognizes the humanity in Peter. The two part ways amicably. In their final chat, Gamora says, You know, I'm still not who you want me to be. And perhaps to her surprise, Peter says, I know. But who you are ain't so bad. It's visibly painful for him, but he lets her go. And it's only after he does that he decides to let the Guardians know he has to forge his own path. Once he recognizes Gamora's humanity, he can start to rediscover his own. And that's going to take us into the next section, the idea that ignorance is bliss. In Guardians of the Galaxy 3, there's an instance where Nebula and Mantis are fighting because Drax goofed up. Both Nebula and Mantis call Drax stupid, but Mantis says something interesting. He has sadness, but he's the only one of you who doesn't hate himself. Of course, when Drax is saddened by Mantis calling him stupid, she makes him forget, and he's just fine. But lampshading aside, this whole thing begs the question, is Drax's stupidity the sole reason he doesn't hate himself? Is ignorance bliss after all? Frankenstein would seem to suggest that it is. If Victor were dumber, he never would have made the creature in the first place, and that, in his mind, would have spared him a lot of turmoil. Victor says, Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, how dangerous the acquirement of knowledge and how much happier the man is 
who believes his native town to be the world, than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. The creature also declares, sorrow only increased with knowledge. Shelley, at least initially, appears to suggest that ignorance is bliss. However, it's not the acquirement of knowledge in and of itself that leads to misery, but the purpose behind the acquirement. What is it you're truly living for? Victor and High Evolutionary are living for glory, whereas Drax is living for family. When the story's first narrator, Walton, describes the titular character, he says Victor appeared to despise himself for being the slave of passion. Peter is a slave of his passion for Gamora. The High Evolutionary is a slave in his passion for Rocket and becoming a god. But Drax also has passions, and he's not a slave. He's not miserable. That's because Peter's and High Evolutionary's passions are a little bit selfish. Don't get me wrong, grieving after the loss of a loved one is beyond acceptable. But we can see that Peter is grieving in an unhealthy way. He hasn't truly processed Gamora's loss. There's no doubt that he loves Gamora, but he does want her back to end his pain, at least in part. As we discussed, he's so obsessed with that objective that he forgets to treat the other timelines Gamora with empathy and humanity. And I don't think I have to explain why the High Evolutionary's motivations are selfish. Drax, on the other hand, is passionate about his family in the Guardians, even if he has a funny way of showing it. He views Peter as his best friend and his feelings for Mantis appear beyond platonic, so passion in general doesn't make a person miserable, but the motivation behind the passion. Is it about glory or is it about self-love? Is it about possession or is it about empathy? These are the questions Peter and the High Evolutionary don't think to ask. In Frankenstein, we see an intelligent character with deep passions who isn't miserable like Victor. Henry Clerval is the ultimate refutation to the idea that ignorance is bliss or that more knowledge inherently creates more misery. Clerval is extremely bright. He might not be a scientist like Victor, but he still takes educational pursuits seriously. Clerval is interested in languages and travel. Victor tells us that Clerval studied Greek and Latin, and once he mastered both, he moved on to Persian, Arabic, and Hebrew in his hopes to travel east. And just as a quick aside, Drax also picks up languages very quickly. He was able to communicate with an invented species after spending no more than a few hours around them. Is that really something a stupid person could do? Look at the way Victor describes Henry. He was a being formed in the very poetry of nature. His wild and enthusiastic imagination was chastened by the sensibility of his heart. His soul overflowed with ardent affections, and his friendship was of that devoted and wondrous nature that the worldly-minded teach us to look for only in the imagination. Does that sound like a sad person to you? And yes, Victor goes on to say there's a sad quality to the life of a traveler. But remember, that's just from Victor's perspective. Victor isn't an omniscient narrator, and it sounds more like he's projecting his own feelings onto Henry. In this question of whether ignorance is bliss, Victor and Henry serve as foils to each other. Both of them are well studied, so what is it that actually regulates their emotions? And no, it's not the fact that Clerval studies the humanities and Victor studies STEM. The BBC opines, Henry's purpose in the novel is to show what Victor could have been had he not been influenced by ambition and the desire for discovery. In that sense, he is Victor's opposite. Toward the beginning of the novel, Victor describes Henry as resolved to pursue no inglorious career. And even if that was true at the beginning of the novel, by the end, we know that's not the case. As Henry progresses throughout the story, he ultimately decides that he wants to be a traveler just for traveling's sake. It's all about motive. If Clerval was really after glory, he'd probably be just as miserable as Victor. But it was never truly about that. Drax's motives are also pure, and as such, he doesn't hate himself. Of course, passion can go a little too far, and Victor addresses this. A human being in perfection ought always to preserve a calm and peaceful mind, and never to allow passion or transitory desire to disturb his tranquility. I do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your affections and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy can possibly mix, then that study is certainly unlawful, that is to say, 
not befitting of the human mind. Victor almost gets it here. In one sense, he's right that if your passion consumes you, then it can't be healthy for you. But at the same time, there are plenty of people who completely devote themselves to their craft and don't go crazy or lose themselves because of it. And again, it's all about the reasoning behind the endeavor. When an expert manages to make time for their craft and everything else they love, it's because their primary focus is the love of their craft. That love seeps into everything they do. When Victor resolves to make the creature, it's not for the love of science, it's for glory. That reasoning clouds his mind and he forgets his family and loved ones. Further proving he was after glory, when Victor finishes his project and finds the creature isn't what he expected, he says, the beauty of the dream vanished. Victor's motivations are clear when he says, the world was to me a secret, which I desired to divine. This is just an illustration of how Victor's ego spills into his pursuits. He doesn't love science just for science's sake. He wants to be the one to find answers. It actually reminds me of this quote from Gravity Falls. Science is a horizon to search for, not a prize to hold in your hand. Victor isn't truly interested in discovery, he's interested in winning. High evolutionary isn't after the good of anyone. He doesn't want to explore or improve, he just wants the perfect society for the sake of it to be the one who did it. Meanwhile, Drax has his priorities straight, for the most part. In fact, there's one instance where his desire to fight interferes with the mission and his love for his family. He lost his focused love and paid the price for it. Victor begins to think that if he were simpler, he'd be happy. Quote, Alas, why does man boast of sensibilities superior to those apparent in the brute? It only renders them more necessary beings. If our impulses were confined to hunger, thirst, and desire, we might be nearly free. But now we are moved by every wind that blows, and a chance word or scene that that word may convey to us. But this theory is demonstrably untrue. The creature, just after being created, feels only hunger, thirst, and desire, but he's not happy. One might argue that animals, or brutes as Victor describes them, feel nothing but hunger, thirst, and desire, but it's still very possible for an animal to be unhappy. It would be easy to suggest that Drax is happy because his mind is simpler than his fellow guardians, but Drax is clearly still capable of complex emotions, and even if he weren't capable of complex thought, that wouldn't be a determinant of his happiness. When the creature discovers fire, he's impressed by its warmth, but taken aback by the pain it inflicts. Or as he describes it, in my joy, I thrust my hand into the live embers, but quickly drew it out again with a cry of pain. How strange, I thought, that the same cause should produce such opposite effects. The same cause can produce opposite effects. Gamora gave Peter so much love and happiness, but her memory equally caused him so much pain. Rocket faces a similar case with the memory of his friends. This might be a cliche, but it's good that loss hurts. The hurt means there were emotions worth feeling in the first place. Complex emotions do create a great deal of pain within us, but by that same token, they can produce indescribable joy. When the creature demands Victor make him a companion, he concludes the request by saying, Make me happy, and I shall again be virtuous. Happiness doesn't make a person automatically virtuous, but conversely, being virtuous does have a high chance of making one happy. We can see that in the growth of the Guardians throughout the three movies. When they decide to be heroes, they feel better about themselves. And that idea is going to lead us into our last main idea, obsession. We've touched on this already, but Victor has an unhealthy desire to obtain glory. He marvels at what glory would attend his discovery. He remarks, I alone should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. His obsession with glory shines through in other ways too, like this instance. I resolved to make the being of a gigantic stature, that is to say, about eight feet in height and proportionably large. Why would Victor choose to make his creature so enormous? There's really no reason for it except for some strange idea of clout. He's doing it because he wants to show off. Or here, a new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. 
Victor is interested in creating a new species, but only for the sake of receiving its praises. Kinda reminds you of someone, no? But he's actually not the only character in Frankenstein with this obsession. The story's first narrator, Robert Walton, to whom Victor is telling his story, is also obsessed with glory through discovery in the Northern Ice Caps. He hopes to find a land surpassing in wonders and in beauty every region hitherto discovered on this habitable globe. He also suggests what fame like that would entail for him. I imagined that I also might obtain a niche in the temple where the names of Homer and Shakespeare are consecrated. However, he would describe his motivation differently. He tells his sister in a letter, You cannot contest the inestimable benefits which I shall confer on all mankind to the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries to reach where at present so many months are requisite, or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be effected by an undertaking such as mine. Walton is desperate to receive glory, though his claimed motivation is the benefit of mankind. We see that with Victor and the High Evolutionary. Walton's obsession is clear when he says, How gladly I would sacrifice my fortune, my existence, my every hope to the furtherance of my enterprise. One man's life or death were but a small price to pay for the acquirement of the knowledge which I sought for the dominion I should acquire and transmit over the elemental foes of our race. High Evolutionary feels the same way. Life is just a disposable resource in his pursuits to create the perfect society. Like Walton, his goal is not the benefit of living things, but personal benefit. The book's preface actually says it better than I can. The plot itself centers on the theme of the overreacher, as the novel's subtitle, The Modern Prometheus, implies. Both Captain Walton, who records Frankenstein's story, and Frankenstein himself seek to immortalize themselves through their scientific discoveries. But while their ostensible motivation is the good of humanity, the novel serves as a cautionary tale against overweening presumption. Though Victor Frankenstein may be the eponymous hero of the work, it is his creation, the miserable and the abandoned abortion, that compels our attention. Frankenstein's rejection of the monster and its subsequent search for a sympathetic community reveal Shelley's concern with the effects of isolation. The High Evolutionary also purports to be a hero. He claims that what he's doing is for the good of life. He wants to create the perfect society, but clearly life doesn't hold that much value to him at all. He has no problem extracting Rocket's brain, killing his friends, and destroying the new world he built for the more evolved animals. Rocket, like the creature, compels our motivation. All of the Guardians are a study into the effects of isolation. Before they found each other, they were only looking out for themselves. Rocket lost his only friend, Peter lost his mother and was abducted by aliens, Gamora was taken from her planet after half her people were slaughtered, and Drax lost his wife and children. It's no wonder they all turned their backs on the world after that point, but it was their togetherness that saved them. We see over and over again in Frankenstein that the true cure for selfishness is friendship and kindness. Walton wants glory, but there's one thing he wants even more than that. But I have one want, which I have never yet been able to satisfy, and the absence of the object of which I now feel as a most severe evil. I have no friend. I have no one near me. That's the difference between Rocket in the first movie and Rocket in the third movie. We might wonder what the High Evolutionary might have been like if he'd had an actual friend. His yes-men don't seem to truly be his friends, and none of his creations actually seem to like him, so what difference might that have made? But keep in mind, his loneliness doesn't excuse his actions. He's not the victim, and no one should receive the blame for not choosing to be his friend. But the effects of isolation are present in all the Guardians who serve as foils to High Evolutionary. Perhaps you can think of powerful men in real life who clearly, desperately need and want a friend, and if they had one, perhaps they wouldn't be so irrational and imbalanced. Look how Victor responds to kindness. Walton describes, If anyone performs an act of kindness towards him, or does him any the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. Granted, this is at the end of Victor's timeline after he feels he doesn't deserve anything, the little whiner. 
but it's a small demonstration of how people change when given meaningful attention and nurturing. Victor should know nurturement better than anyone thanks to his parents. Yeah, that's right, we're going to talk about parentage again. Look how well Frankenstein was raised. My mother's tender caresses and my father's smile of benevolent pleasure while regarding me are my first recollections. I was their plaything and their idol, and something better, their child, the innocent and helpless creature bestowed on them by heaven, whom to bring up to good, and whose future lot it was in their hands to direct to happiness or misery, according as they fulfilled their duties towards me. With this deep consciousness of what they owed towards the being to which they had given life, added to the active spirit of tenderness that animated both, it may be imagined that while during every hour of my infant life I received a lesson of patience, of charity, of self-control, I was so guided by a silken cord that all seemed but one train of enjoyment to me. Victor's parentage made him entitled, and that's not necessarily his parents' fault, we could also blame a lack of self-awareness on Victor's part. Regardless, one would assume that with Victor's exemplary parentage, he would be a more willing caretaker to his creature, but no. Once his creature lives, Victor abandons him completely. He also doesn't do anything to prevent what happens after that, almost as if he feels it should just stop on its own. He's spoiled. Walton also feels a sense of entitlement. And now, dear sister, do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? In a similar but different way, Peter and the High Evolutionary feel a sense of entitlement, though perhaps not because of their parentage. Still, can't you just imagine High Evolutionary saying, Do I not deserve to create the perfect society, with all my strength and intelligence? Or Peter saying, Do I not deserve Gamora in my life, after everything I've sacrificed, after everything I've done for the universe? The difference is that Peter learns to let go of that entitlement. The High Evolutionary doesn't, and just like Victor, it causes his own undoing. There are so many more similarities between Victor and High Evolutionary, as well as the monster and rocket, especially the rocket we see in the first movie. Victor describes his temper as, sometimes violent and my passions vehement. A bit of an understatement, but High Evolutionary is the same way. We see that when he shouts at Rocket, waking him up in the night to drag him to an experiment. The situation here is reminiscent of a drunken, abusive parent waking their child up in the middle of the night, similar to the poem, My Papa's Waltz. When Victor dismantles the creature's future companion, he partly does it out of spite against the monster. I had before been moved by the sophisms of the being I had created. I had been struck senseless by his fiendish threats. But now, for the first time, the wickedness of my promise burst upon me. I shuddered to think that future ages might curse me as their pest, whose selfishness had not hesitated to buy its own peace, at the price, perhaps, of the existence of the whole human race. He's not looking out for the good of anyone, he just fears what the public would think of him. Again, we see that all he truly cares about is glory. He has no interest in doing good by his creation or even by the rest of humanity, he just cares about his image. That truth is further confirmed in this quote. I abhorred the face of man. Oh, not abhorred, they were my brethren, my fellow beings, and I felt attracted even to the most repulsive among them, as to creatures of an angelic nature and celestial mechanism. But I felt I had no right to share their intercourse. I had unchained an enemy among them, whose joy it was to shed their blood, and to revel in their groans. How they would, each and all, abhor me and hunt me from the world, did they know my unhallowed acts and the crimes which had their source in me. Victor claims to love even the most repulsive human, but has no love to share for his creation, his own son. He completely mischaracterizes the creature by asserting the monster loves to shed blood. He doesn't. He only sees it as necessary based on Victor's actions. And even in the end, Victor doesn't see his actions as deplorable. He doesn't regret his behavior. Quote, During these last days I had been occupied in examining my past conduct, nor do I find it blamable. In a fit of enthusiastic madness I created a rational creature, and was bound towards him, to assure as far as was in my power his happiness and well-being. This was my duty. But there was another still paramount to that. My duties toward the beings of my own species had greater claims to my attention, 
because they included a greater proportion of happiness or misery. He is so close to getting it, but his obsession with glory leads him to think he hasn't done anything wrong. He believes his duty is to his fellow beings in never having created the monster, but we all know what that's a dog whistle for. He's just concerned with what they would have thought of him. Victor even asserts the happiness of mankind somehow matters more than the happiness of the creature, but with no justification. Ultimately, Victor's obsession led to his demise. The monster confronts Victor on his deathbed and says, Thou didst seek my extinction, that I might not cause greater wretchedness. The irony here is, of course, that the creature would have caused no wretchedness if Frankenstein had never a. created him, or b. after creating him, neglected him. Frankenstein brought about his own demise, as did High Evolutionary. It's classic tragedy stuff. Victor couldn't help but regard his creation with total disgust. After the creature kills William, Victor remarks, how much more a murderer that could destroy such radiant innocence. Victor is the one who truly rejects and destroys innocence, shunning his newborn creature. That dynamic is what, of course, led to the idea, Frankenstein isn't the name of the monster, but isn't he truly the monster? In that same vein, the High Evolutionary utterly destroyed Rocket's innocence. If Rocket had any left in the first place, killing his friends definitely severed that cord. Rocket might be the more creature-ish between the two, but which one is truly the monster? That idea becomes almost heavy-handed in the end when Gamora peels back the High Evolutionary's face to reveal how monstrous he is. His hatred made him ugly on the inside. And speaking of hatred, Victor describes his reaction to merely thinking of the monster. I gnashed my teeth, my eyes became inflamed, and I already wished to extinguish that life which I had so thoughtlessly bestowed. Victor hates his creature and has no problem with the thought of taking his life. The High Evolutionary is the same way. His obsession evolves into hatred. He has no qualms about taking Rocket's brain. The monster knows that's how Victor feels. He tells his creator, you would, with a satisfied conscience, destroy your own creature. The High Evolutionary's conscience is also unaffected by his many murders. When looking at the events of Guardians of the Galaxy chronologically, it's no wonder Rocket is so jaded in the first movie. He went through a similar upbringing as Victor's monster. The creature explains to Victor, Shall I not then hate them who abhor of death until it be me? I will keep no terms with my enemies. I am miserable, and they shall share my wretchedness. Yet, it is in your power to recompense me. Rocket feels no obligation to the world because the world has done nothing for him. In the first movie, he didn't care if other people were miserable. He was only looking out for himself. In the first movie, he asks Peter, What has the galaxy ever done for you? Why would you want to save it? In Frankenstein, the creature also saves a little girl from drowning. But when the girl's caretaker finds her with the monster, he shoots the girl's savior. He asks, This was then the reward of my benevolence? Rocket is also punished for attempting to do the right thing. He tried to save his friends, and they died as a result. It's no wonder he was so reluctant to do any good thing in the first movie. Moreover, the creature explains that, in his short life, he had never yet seen a being resembling me, or who claimed any intercourse with me. What was I? The question again recurred, to be answered only with groans. A running joke throughout the three films is that Rocket has no idea what a raccoon is. He has no knowledge of beings akin to himself. Much like the creature, Rocket probably feels adrift as a result. It's reminiscent of another lovable lab-created monster. The creature further said, I am an unfortunate and deserted creature. I look around and I have no relation or friend upon Earth, and where they ought to see a feeling and kind friend, they behold only a detestable monster. Rocket feels the same way. Notice the way Peter looks at Rocket in the first movie. It's understandable, but also rude. Once the two spend some time together, get to know each other, and learn from one another, they become best friends. And like the creature, Rocket is never given a name. Victor never cares enough to refer to his creature as anything but fiend or demon or names of that nature. High Evolutionary only refers to Rocket as 89P13. We can almost read this as a parent dead naming their child. Rocket has to choose a real name for himself, something the creature didn't even consider. Or if he did consider it, he didn't say so to any of the narrators. The monster does have a purpose, but once he accomplishes it, 
he realizes how hollow it all is. He sees Victor on his deathbed and exclaims, That is also my victim. In his murder my crimes are consummated. The miserable series of my being is wound to its close. Even the creature ended up being the victim of obsession, the obsession of ruining Victor's life. Once he takes everything from Victor, he realizes he has nothing more to live for. It is a consummation, as he says. Rocket also finds a consummation of sorts when he goes to face the High Evolutionary, but unlike the creature, Rocket hasn't devoted his life to destroying his creator. His consummation comes when he discovers what he is. He discovers that he's not the only one of his kind, a raccoon. This is a luxury that the creature was never afforded. Rocket manages to rise above his creator, and not just in any physical or mental way as the monster does with Victor. The monster tells Victor, Thou hast made me more powerful than thyself. Rocket is smarter than his creator, and High Evolutionary can't handle that. Abusive parents want to be able to control their children, just like Victor wants to control and eventually destroy the creature. It infuriates High Evolutionary that he can't control Rocket, which feeds the obsession to reclaim him. Also, it's interesting that High Evolutionary is so interested in creativity and original ideas in his creations, when he himself is just copying and pasting art and aesthetics from his brief time researching Earth. And if High Evolutionary were to look a little closer, he would see that there is plenty of personality in his creations. We even see Phi Lavelle express herself at the end of the movie once she has a loving family in the Guardians. High Evolutionary is missing the point entirely. He strives for perfection, but paradoxically, perfection can't exist the way he wants if everyone is their own person. His unwillingness to accept that is what leads him to continue committing mass genocide and starting from scratch. He's unwilling to make things better. He can only strive to make things perfect, which is impossible under his criteria. And the same happens for Victor, even though his experiment had the exact intended effect. For some reason, he just can't handle it when he succeeds. Quote, Breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bedchamber, unable to compose my mind to sleep. There are many reasons for this, but for one thing, it just wasn't as perfect as he envisioned, and that wrecks him. He abandons the whole thing. Again, perhaps you can think of powerful men who are unwilling to try and make the world better, explaining instead they want to create a perfect society. And ultimately, as Rocket told his creator, you didn't want to make things perfect. You just hated things the way they are. The idea of the creature becoming stronger than its creator is explored further when the monster reads Paradise Lost. Quote, it moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent god warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. Rocket accomplished what Satan couldn't by defeating his creator. The difference, of course, was that Rocket's motivations were moral, whereas in Paradise Lost, Satan's motivations are depicted as evil. The point is that living beings can rise above their expectations. They can grow beyond what they believe they were created for. The creature realizes this to an extent when he tells Victor, You are my creator, but I am your master. The High Evolutionary may have created Rocket, and Rocket may be a weird little guy, but which of them is truly the higher being? At a certain point, the creature learns empathy and humanity, whereas Victor would not. The creature tells Walton that Victor could not sum up the hours and months of misery which I endured, wasting in impotent passions. Frankenstein cannot capture even a portion of what the creature truly went through. Empathy is difficult, but not impossible. Frankenstein wasn't willing to give any. In observing Felix's family, the creature reflects, If such lovely creatures were miserable, it was less strange that I, an imperfect and solitary being, should be wretched. Realizing that other people go through struggles actually helps us understand ourselves and the world. Rocket regains humanity when he joins the Guardians. The creature's ability to empathize actually initially leads him to treat Victor like a human, where the same decency isn't returned. I am content to reason with you. I am malicious because I am miserable. Am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? You, my creator, would tear me to pieces and triumph. Remember that, and tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me. You would not call it murder if you could precipitate me into one of those ice rifts and destroy my frame, the work of your own hands. Shall I respect man when he condemns me? 
Once Rocket learns virtue, he rises above his creator. He pities the High Evolutionary and chooses to spare his life, even though the villain wouldn't afford Rocket any of the same decency. Even though Rocket experienced so much misery, he still shook off his maliciousness, in large part thanks to his found family. The creature does come to pity Frankenstein, and Rocket comes to pity High Evolutionary as well. But it's not just pity that leads him to spare High Evolutionary. It's true compassion, the kind that he never learned from his creator. Rocket rose above the state that the creature was in, almost entirely due to the empathy that Rocket eventually received. The monster laments, Once I falsely hoped to meet with beings who, pardoning my outward form, would love me for the excellent qualities which I was capable of unfolding. I was nourished with high thoughts of honor and devotion, but now crime has degraded me beneath the meanest animal. Rocket obtained what the creature so desperately wished for. It wasn't too late for him to give up his life of crime, and he found a society that would accept him despite everything he was. As a result, he changed. The monster decided within himself that he couldn't change unless he received some sort of connection. Quote, If I have no ties and no affections, hatred and vice must be my portion. This doesn't have to be the case, but it's all too common in the real world. And credit where credit is due, the monster tried his best to make connections with others, but it didn't pan out. Victor, the one person who had every responsibility toward the creature, could have shown him the affection needed to reject hatred. The High Evolutionary also shook any responsibility to Rocket, instead killing his friends and leading him down the path of misery. We have to ask ourselves, to whom do we have a responsibility? Like in The Good Place, the question of what we owe each other keeps coming up. Do we owe each other anything? It reminds me of this quote from the end of Mrs. Dalloway, where the character Sally reflects, thinking, For what can one know even of the people one lives with every day? She asked. Are we not all prisoners? She had read a wonderful play about a man who scratched on the wall of his cell, and she had felt that was true of life. One scratched on the wall, despairing of human relationships. People were so difficult. She often went into her garden and got from her flowers a piece which men and women never gave her. But no, Peter did not like cabbages. He preferred human beings. If this life is just a prison, don't we at least owe it to each other to decorate the cell with flowers? To prefer human beings to commodities? To know one another? As the monster says, My heart yearned to be known and loved by these amiable creatures. I required kindness and sympathy. At the end of the day, all of us simply yearn to be known and loved. We all require kindness and sympathy. So let's put a little more kindness and sympathy out into the world. The effort might save the next rocket raccoon, and think of how many people he saved as a result. So there we have it. Possession is damaging, ignorance is not bliss, and obsession will be our demise without empathy. If you've stuck with me this far, thank you. This is one of my favorite things about reading, intertextuality. The Cambridge Dictionary defines intertextuality as the connections between different works of literature and art, and the meanings that are created by them. But I think I actually like the Wikipedia definition even more. Intertextuality is the shaping of a text's meaning by another text, either through deliberate compositional strategies such as quotation, allusion, calc, plagiarism, translation, pastiche, or parody, or by interconnections between similar or related works perceived by an audience or reader of the text. That definition is particularly good because it synthesizes the definitions found in these six sources, but look, here's the thing. We know for a fact Mary Shelley wasn't referencing Rocket Raccoon in her works, even though the opposite might be true. But whether or not a reference is intentional, making connections like these is so important when it comes to deriving meaning from a story. The intertextuality inherent in all stories helps us understand literature, the world, and each other that much better. We are here to make connections. I want to close out on some writing advice from Mary Shelley herself. As she said in the author's note at the beginning of Frankenstein, Invention, it must be humbly admitted, does not consist in creating out of void, but out of chaos. Invention consists in the capacity of seizing on the capabilities of a subject, and in the power of molding and fashioning ideas suggested to it. Good writing requires a bit of chaos. Formulas are okay, absolutely. 
but what do you inject into that formula to make it unique? Captain Midnight just did a video on Kevin Feige mentioning how James Gunn took Feige's established rules for Marvel movies and expanded them, improving the provided guidelines. Moreover, the Guardians are just so wacky to begin with. These are some of the most creative characters of the last decades, and the creativity and the concept shines through in the execution. But hey, what did you think of my analysis? Is there any point you think I'm incorrect on or anything you would add? Please tell me everything. And keep in mind, ultimately, this is a rough draft. <laughs>